welcome Mr. John Jordan and uh, Monsieur Delarant, and uh, thank you for being with us this evening for talk. Uh, for the Student Prize of History Book, organized by the History Festival, Les Herbes Rendez-vous de l'Histoire de Blois. Uh, the magazine, L'Histoire, and the Ministry of Education. Mr. Jordan, uh, you were a professor of medieval history at, Prist at Princeton University in the US. This evening, three French high school students and representatives are here with us to ask you some questions. Lycée René Char from Avignon, Lycée Fenlon from Lille, and Lycée Henri IV from Paris. We will start with the Lycée René Char representative who will ask the first question. The floor is yours. As an American historian, how did you get interested in Louis IX, the Crusades, and the conversion of Muslims? Well, when I went to graduate school, I, I, I went to graduate school at Princeton University to get my to write my PhD dissertation, and my advisor uh, had, was himself an expert uh, on the reign of Louis the Ninth. And in the course of a seminar with him, uh, I wrote a paper, and uh, he suggested that I might take the ideas that I uh, expressed in that paper and develop them into a, a thesis, a, a dissertation. Um, he was also, this teacher of mine, was um, a historian of the Crusades. And um, so I combined my interest in Louis IX and the Crusades, since Louis IX led to Crusades. And my, my thesis, my thesis, was on, uh, really, it became my first book, Louis IX and the Challenge of the Crusade. How, to, how he actually put together this enormous war, extraordinarily well planned. And um, I wanted to see the effect it might have on French society uh, in the 13th century. The last part is about conversion that you mentioned. And the paper that I actually wrote for that seminar with my teacher was a paper on uh, conversion or the pressures of Christianity on Judaism, not on Muslims, but on Judaism, on Jews. Um, but a number of sources that I, right from the beginning of my career that I came in contact with, um, narrative sources, tended to mention that Louis IX also reached out to Muslims to convert. Now, most scholars had not followed this up. They had, I think they thought it was something that someone would write about a Christian king who uh, uh, was going to become a saint, who was going to be canonized later on. And they were trying to just sort of um, make him seem even more holy uh, than he was. But in the back of my mind, there was something about these repeated mentions of Louis' interest in, the con in conversion, and particularly conversion of the Muslims, that I always wanted to come back to, and I had the opportunity a few years ago. I hope that answers your question. So the second question is an American historian how did you manage to get an access to the sources of your book is based on? Um, from the time that I did research uh, for my PhD dissertation, uh, I became an archival historian, a historian who worked in archives, whether it was at the Bibliothèque Nationale uh, in Paris or the Archive Nationale. And I particularly liked to do archival work in, at the more local level, in the in the département, and so I, as an archival historian, there isn't really a great difficulty in getting access as long as you have a you know reasonable, what's the word for it? If you can make a reasonable case for your need of access to documents from the 12th or the 13th or, or the 14th century, it's true. Occasionally, I would um, run into some not exactly opposition, but surprise. Uh, why are you interested? I was in the department of uh, the Departement of the Gare and uh, the archivist there asked me why was I interested in the 13th century? I tried to explain I was interested in how the town of Egmort was sort of built from just from nothing by Louis IX as a port uh, for his crusaders. Um, he took me to a map and he tried ask me questions about the routes back and forth, and I seemed to actually know something about it. And so he finally said, oh, well, you certainly can see the documents. 
But then he said something that has always been with me ever since. He said, um, are you from Senegal? Thinking that I, I, I could only be interested in French history if I had come from a place where it, that had been a French colony. And my answer to him, I think really, he's probably still standing there. <laughs> I said, no, I'm from Chicago, Chicago. <laughs> and he just burst out laughing. He didn't know how to deal with that. Um, so I've always been an archival historian. And so I, those kinds of sources were relatively easy to get access to. Uh, the, I was also fortunate in my career to make friends with a number of very senior and some at the time junior historians in France who would help me out with things that say we didn't have in the United States. Although Princeton University libraries, I must say, are some of the best in the world. And, um, but uh, Jacques Legoff was, I think, the person who was uh, extremely kind to me. Uh, I was working on Louis the Ninth when I first went to France to work on my dissertation. There actually were people there who said, "Why are you working on Louis the Ninth? Jacques Lagoff is uh, working on Louis the Ninth. You don't need to work on Louis the Ninth." But I didn't feel that I could go back and talk to my teacher in Princeton and saying, "You gave me a very bad topic <laughs> because Jacques Lagoff is working on it." So I decided to work on it anyway. And he was always kind uh, as he learned about it. And we often exchanged things. And uh, I could always turn to people who were uh, very friendly, very kind, um, who seemed to be interested in what I had to say. And I was certainly interested in what they had to say. But it doesn't hurt to have a library that's one of the greatest in the, in the world. That's about 15 seconds from where I, I have my office. So. Thank you. Um, good evening, Mr. Jordan. Uh, my question is, uh, are Americans in general, and especially researchers at Princeton University, very much interested in French medieval history? Actually, there's enormous popular interest in the Middle Ages in, in France and England, uh, in the United States about the Middle Ages in France and England. Um, the, I mean, a very, I'm talking about popular interest, and that is to say uh, children love stories about cathedrals and tales of knights in shining armor and the crusades and uh, the Arthurian legends, you know, the round table and this sort of thing. I even once wrote an article in part on representations of the Middle Ages in cartoons in which I sort of hired my little children to watch cartoons as much as they wanted and to take notes and to uh, um, you know, tell me all of the sort of images of the Middle Ages that were in in these cartoons, and that was kind of fun. But if we talk about if we talk about uh, what I might say is the more serious study of the Middle Ages, it's is incredible interest. Uh, sometimes medieval history courses, uh, particularly the Crusades, which for obvious reasons, but uh, others as well, are some of the largest in American universities on the human on the side of the humanities. Very very large courses, um, and for me personally at Princeton, the tradition uh, has been of doing, the tradition is to do, for the scholars to do, uh, to concentrate on France. Um, my teacher, whom I mentioned before, but not by name, was Joseph Strayer. He had gone to Princeton as an undergraduate, and then he went to Harvard to get his PhD with Charles Homer Haskins. Charles Homer Haskins was one of the founders of the field of medieval history in the United States, and his first book was on, uh, Norman institutions, institutions in Normandy uh, before 1066. Um, he then trained a whole generation of students uh, in French history and also in intellectual history. But in French history, and Joseph Strayer, my teacher, his first book was called The Administration of Normandy uh, uh, under St. Louis. And then I've already, again, referred to my, my, that paper I wrote for that graduate seminar with Professor Strayer, and it was about Jews in Normandy uh, in the very difficult period uh, of the 12, late 1240s uh, as the crusade was being prepared for in, in France. So there is a, a, a long history in, in Princeton in particular of doing very, ser I believe, very serious French medieval history. My other teacher at Princeton was Gaines Post who did much more intellectual history but uh, but his again his his first major articles were on the University of Paris and, and its corporate character. 
So uh, I, I, I got a lot of doses of French medieval history. And the, the one thing that I, I will say, which is very personal, was that almost the moment I got off the plane in Paris that first time, getting ready to do my research and go to the Bibliothèque Nationale and then go down to Montpellier and, and so forth, I fell in love with the country. I just thought, you know, if I weren't an American, I could be a Frenchman. Uh, I, I just uh, I just thought it was wonderful. Um, I don't know. Anyway, the, the the tradition here of doing French history, not just in the history department, uh, but in art history as well, uh, is very, very strong. Um, what role does the instinct play in the work of the historian? Well, that's a, that's a difficult question. Luck is one thing. I don't know if that's instinct, but I've been very lucky to discover documents sometimes. Instinct. In college, before I came to Princeton to do my, my dissertation, I was actually, uh, I'm trained in mathematics. I, I, I have a natural talent, it seems, in math. I did at the time. Maybe I wouldn't have any more, but I certainly did at the time. Um, and I've always, so if that, something that's inside me and it's instinctual that I can handle uh, these sorts of uh, intellectual problems in mathematics, then I've always been, I think, uh, even as a historian, uh, logically rigorous about sources and the, the source critique, how you criticize sources, and about arguments. I, I have not much um, patience for uh, sloppy arguments. And I'm, I'm sure um, that has probably made me a, a maybe even a too rigorous teacher with my students, but they seem to do well. Um, so when I see contradictions in arguments, even if they're subtle, I, I, I wanna pursue them. I want to see why really in, intelligent people seem to have uh, come up with uh, statements which are contrary to the um, to what I think a more rigorous treatment of the sources would yield to. Again, I don't know if any of this can properly be called instinctual, but I think it is part of my nature uh, that, I, that I just don't accept arguments that aren't tight. Um, that's, that's part of my being. According to Benedetto Croce, history is nothing but contemporary. Would you say that the current news about then could we relate to studying to today's migrant issue? Well, I mean, I think that the questions that you've raised are um, some of the most difficult for me. Surely, in my mind, I have seen the fact that France is going through a difficult time with regard to the question of immigration and assimilation. In some ways, I have written a book that has something to do with immigration and something to do with assimilation. And it deals with a group of people, uh, Muslims, who are uh, the, the same people who are, the, the issues are being discussed now. But I'm very, very uh, wary. I'm, I'm very, very hesitant of any blanket reading of the past as a blueprint for the present or as a commentary on the present. Um, I actually believe that the danger of presentism, of thinking about the present, and then is that it makes you look at the past and try to find things that are the same. And that's actually a, a distortion. I think one has to be very, very careful. There's no way, however, that I was not aware as I was writing this book and as it came out, uh, there was no way I was not, I was unaware that certain people would read it in a way that I might not want them to read it. I tried very carefully to avoid making any pronouncements that could be taken out of context in a, in a negative way about anybody or any group. I, I know that objectivity is, as it's said by uh, one scholar, a noble dream, but it's a dream worth dreaming. Uh, it's, it's, it's worth trying to, uh, trying to achieve. Um, but I, I live in the world, I'm part of the world. They, these things are going on all the time. And I have friends around me who say, oh, what do you think, Bill? You just, 
you just wrote that book, you just published that book, and this is now happening. Uh, and I'm always just a little bit tender to give my opinion about uh, about that because I don't want my personal opinion about the issues of today to affect my reconstruction insofar as I've been successful of the problems of the past and the solutions of the past. Um, thank you both for answering our questions. We also thank our classmates from Union Paris High Schools and our teacher, Ms. Cleval, Mr. Raymond, Ms. Damasso, and Ms. Sira. Uh, finally, we thank the people who organized the prize for giving us the opportunity to attend this uh, meeting. Um, we look forward to seeing you on September 18th for the national jury of the prize to choose the student's favorite book.